Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of the Almighty Creator of Heaven and Earth versus the Gods of the Slave Trade, Part 3. Important Notice Do we believe in one Almighty Creator of Heaven and Earth? Yes, we do. It is not our intention to offend or hurt anyone with this video. We believe that the truth is still the truth, even if no one believes it. We also believe that a lie is still a lie, even if everyone believes it. Are they really the same? God, Yahweh, Allah, Jehovah, Jesus, Muhammad, the gods of Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Are they really the almighty creator of heaven and earth? If these gods were all the same, their laws would all be the same because there is only one creator. Remember, we are focusing on these three religions because they were the religions of the slave trade and we want to establish if they are object of worship, if whatever they reference is the same as the creator of heaven and earth. Remember, the almighty creator of heaven and earth never created Islam, never created Judaism, never created Christianity, never created religion, but instead created a way of life by handing down laws and statutes. So the religions you have today, Christianity, Islam and Judaism are purely man-made and they do not have any relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. Have you wondered how the almighty creator could have asked the Muslims, Christians and so-called Jews to enslave the Negroes? Where and how the Muslims or Mohammedans met the almighty creator and he gave them legitimacy to do so. How the Negroes could have been the only pagans who the deities of Islam and Christianity marked for slavery. And how the Almighty Creator can say one thing today and say another thing tomorrow. Here is a little flow diagram of what we want you to be looking at from the origin of time to the time Moses was on the scene and from that beginning when people like the egyptians abandoned the almighty creator remember the world would have been fewer people at that time meaning that the people will know who made them or who created them and will have direct relationship with the creator so at which point did the egyptians abandon the creator of heaven and earth and after moses who and who worshipped the almighty creator then we remember the arrival of the son of the almighty creator and the arrival of Muhammad which occurred 600 years after the son of the almighty creator. So at which point did humans forget their creator? Because what we have today is a situation where some people are yet to hear about this creator if we go by the narrative of these three religions. whereas. If the world started with say two people or three people or no matter how many they were, at that time they would have direct communication and relationship with their maker. So as the population grew, people could have departed. And you remember if we assume that the so-called promised land is a physical geographical location, the children of Israel encountered a lot of people living along the way at that time. So we need to understand how those other people did not know about the almighty creator and it is only these people that were slaves in Egypt that knew about him. So let us reference a book called The Negro Races, a sociological study, volume 1. The Negritos comprising the Pygmies, Bushmen and Hottentots of Central and South Africa, the Negritians comprising the Jalobs, Mandingos, Hausas, Ashantis, Dahomeans, etc. of the Sudan and the Tibus of the Sahara Desert and the Felathas of Central Sudan by Jerome Daoud and it was published 1907. Here we see that the missionaries to the African has done what my father found him doing to the Polynesians. Regarding the native minds as so many jugs only requiring to be emptied, 
of the stuff which is in them and refilled with the particular form of dogma he is engaged in teaching in order to make them the equals of the white races. This form of procedure works in very various ways. It eliminates those parts of the native fetish that were a wholesome restaurant on the African. Those Africans who are the chief mainstay of missionary reports and who afford such material for the scoffer thereof have merely had the restraint of fear removed from their minds in the mission schools without the greater restraint of love being put in its place. So the goal of this narrative is for you to understand that these religions never came with salvation. They were brought for a specific purpose, which if they were really talking about the almighty creator of heaven and earth, they won't be filled with sublime messages and they will have the most honest and genuine intentions. Here again from the same book, it tells us that the Africans have been subjected to a line of treatment exactly opposite to that which every race must undergo in its progress from savagery to civilization. First, the missionary arrives upon the scene and attempts to change the psychological life of the people by imparting literary education and cramming the Negro brain with the highly abstract doctrines and philosophy of Christianity but leaving his industrial life untouched. Next come the colonial officials with their brass buttons, red trousers and other grilgers who make some effort to maintain peace and protect commerce but upset native institutions and issue formal proclamations of emancipation to a people who have not learned the first principle of economic independence and who interpret the proclamation to mean that no one need work if he does not wish to. Then, having set the natives free and created a labor famine, these same champions of emancipation turn around and re-enslave the natives under the disguise of penal labor contracts and a variety of other cunning subterfuges. Finally, when the psychological life of the people is disorganized, the native institutions overthrown, the economic life paralyzed and the labor problem reaches an acute stage, the missionaries and brass buttoned colonial officials awake to the need of introducing technical and industrial schools and attempting to do something by way of giving to the native societies some kind of industrial foundation, all of which is putting the horse behind the cart and its stupidity is only equaled by its absurdity. Again, from what we read, you see that it was never for salvation, so it couldn't have been the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So again, we see from the same book where it tells us that many African superstitions are not only as harmless as a child's belief in Santa Claus, but beautiful and temporarily beneficial in cultivating the poetic faculties and even in promoting good conduct. The belief in spirits has not been incompatible with the progress of civilization and Christianity among the whites, but may have been in many ways not yet known to us, necessary and valuable. The wise missionary therefore will begin his work by attending to the native's daily life, especially to his sanitary needs, which by the way are emphasized by Christ, and attacking first and gradually those fictions only which have an injurious effect upon conduct. Again, remember where it tells us that the belief in spirits has not been incompatible with the progress of civilization and Christianity among the whites, but may have been in many ways not yet known to us, necessary and valuable. So again, you see that what they are talking about is totally different from the almighty creator of heaven and earth. We can proceed to show that these three religions are not referring to the almighty creator of heaven and earth by looking at the practical aspects of how they are being propagated. So if we look at the page, which is from the same book, it tells us that about the Fulanese. 
The Hausas call them Felani, Fulani or Fobes. The Canaries call them Felatas. The Mandingos call them Pools and the Arabs call them Fulan. They were also known as Fubis, Pulos, Futa, Toros, etc. But it goes just further down. It tells us that they were by nature nomadic and did not live in large towns like the Negroes, but in temporary huts of reeds, straw or skins, dispersed over the grassy plains in such a way as apparently not to encroach in the least upon the territory under cultivation by the blacks. So the, this reading tells us two things, that they are not Negroes and they are not blacks. So those are the things we get here. And of course, they are not indigenous to the area where they are. So let's move forward and look at what it tells us further down about Otman Danfodio. And he says, Federman says, he emerged from the forest of Ada or Talida, established himself in the province of Guba, where he built a city. And there the Felathas began to rally under his banner. He appointed chiefs over the different divisions, to each of whom he delivered a white standard, enjoining upon them to go out and conquer in the name of God and the Prophet, adding that Allah had given to the Felathas the lands and the riches of all the unbelievers because they were the only faithful of Islam. He affirmed that every Felatha warrior that was wounded or was killed in the battle was sure to gain heaven or paradise. So now, your question should be, where did he see the Almighty Creator that told him that the riches of the unbelievers have been given to his race? Remember, if you look at this from a very narrow point of view, you will forget that there is no law that states that the Felatas cannot be unbelievers. Remember? So if he is saying whatever God he is saying has given him the riches of the unbelievers to his race, that means he is lying. Because what it, it just means is that the, that God is giving everybody, whether they believe or not, provided they are Fulanese. Whereas the same almighty creator created everyone and gave us different nationalities or different attributes. So it becomes impossible that the Almighty Creator could have met this guy around 18-something to tell him. Meanwhile, remember, this is the wholesale dealer in slaves. So there is no way this is possible. He must be lying. So it is very easy for us to prove that Danfodio is lying and that even if he saw anything, it couldn't have been the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So if we reference a book called The Slave Trade in Africa in 1872, principally carried on for the supply of Turkey, Egypt, Persia, and Zanzibar by E.T.M. Felix Bilox, and it was published in 1872, we see the following account. It tells us about the slave market which belonged to this same sultan and his lineage, as it were. So we see where it tells us that on the square, the best adapted for the slave markets, one is sure every day to find several hundreds, but on Monday, the great sale day, they may be numbered by thousands. The blacks are there exhibited in their pitiable plight, partially covered with miserable tatters. The wholesale merchants and connoisseurs have no need to be attracted by a more delicate exposition such as that which one would meet within a retail purchase. The slave is examined with care, taking measure of his height, opening his mouth, counting his teeth, asking questions about the appetite, etc. The price demanded is according to the age, strength and color of the prisoner and varies from half a sovereign to five pounds for the current merchandise. Is this all that a man is worth? And is this the estimate put on human liberty? There are other markets at which the slave is considered of still less value. So you see the highlighted portion now tells us who this same man claiming that God gave him other people's riches is. He said, but one, whence come all these wretched beings? It is here that the eastern traffic is presented to us under a particular aspect. 
such as it did not assume on the western coast of Africa. In the organized commerce of slaves, man hunting, which supplies the victims for these markets, is not only encouraged by the brutal ferocity of the chief of a tribe, it is considered an act commanded by religion. The Sultan, who goes to make razias at the head of warriors, with whom he divides the booty by an impious aberration, believes that he performs a pious work in spreading devastation around him. This is the effect of the old Mohammedan influence, and the sword of the knights follows the infidel enemies of the Quran. So the accusation is a solemn one. The Sultan Emdroff informs us is a wholesale merchant himself. What is that in which he deals? What is it? Why his brother man? He procures such for his own benefit by razias over the surrounding peoples or over his own subjects so long as these leather have not embraced Islamism. So you see, the same person that claimed that God gave the lands and riches of the unbelievers to the Fulani is also the same that was slave raiding his own people as far as they have not embraced Islamism. So you see, there is no way the Almighty Creator could have given it to the Fulani and at the same time indicating that it's only those that believe. So two different things. This proves that Damfodio is a liar. And of course, we all know that he couldn't have seen the Almighty Creator. He could have seen any other thing, but certainly not the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. So now that we have seen and established that he is a liar and he lied. Remember, the essence of this is all the bloodshed you are seeing in sub-Saharan Africa today is the people fighting to achieve what he has told them that God gave them the land. So Europeans probably of course have read this and the cabal, their group and Americans see it as an avenue to sell their weapons. Remember, if it is the almighty creator that parted the Red Sea, if we believe all those stories, there is no way he will need weapons from the Europeans to be able to get the riches that the almighty creator could have given to the Fulani. He didn't give to the Chinese. He didn't give to the Japanese. He's only giving him the riches of those he has been raiding for slaves. So this is the wholesale merchant for slaves. Now that the slave trade was over, he has coined another phrase to tell his people that, the, they go, that God has given them the land and riches of the unbelievers. So you see how treacherous these people are. There is no way you can convince any sensible person that he was talking about the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So he's talking about his own God or any other God, but certainly not the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So again, remember, all the wars you see in sub-Saharan Africa are caused by this. The armies you see in those places are caused by this. These things that he is saying that God gave them, many of the votaries of their religion believe it. And that's where the challenge is. That's why all the bloodshed and all the problems. So that is why we need to see how best we can emancipate or help the Negroes and Blacks emancipate themselves from mental slavery and stop worshipping the idols of the oppressors because they are not worshipping the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So again, in the case of Christianity, to further show you that none of these religions are pointing to the creator of heaven and earth, we see where it tells us that when therefore the slave trade from Africa began, it met only feeble opposition here and there. That opposition was in nearly all cases stilled when it was continually stated that the slave trade was simply a method of converting the heathen to Christianity. So the corollary that the conscience of Europe immediately drew was that after conversion, the Negro slave was to become in all essential respects like other servants and laborers that is bound to toil perhaps under general regulations, but personally free with recognized rights and duties. So you see that there is no way these two, three religions can be talking about the almighty creator of heaven and earth because these are man-made. Again, remember, there is no way somebody can be staying the, the, the slave trade, which you have seen how it was conducted. If you have watched our other series about the slave raids, 
and you have seen that they were done by the Christians and Muslims together. So now, the reason you don't hear that aspect is because both control the propaganda. They keep telling people how Islam doesn't support the slave trade, pretend not to know what they did, but they are still working together. If you watch other series, you will also see where Muslims were saying it was a tool to convert the heathen to Islamism. So you understand exactly what we're talking about. There is no way they can be referring to the Almighty Creator. And we will go further to prove that to you. So again, we see where it tells us that a slave ship named Jehovah made three voyages between Brazil and Angola in 13 months of 1836 to 37 and landed 700 slaves the first voyage 600 the second and 520 the third in all 1820 and the book reference uh, for Buxton so you see that there is no way these people can be talking about the almighty creator of heaven and earth it's impossible if you looked at it because remember you might say, oh no, they just gave the name. If you check the religion by right, if it says you shall not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain, and Jehovah is his name, and you use it for a slave ship, simply because you believed you were doing his work, there is no way the Almighty Creator could have mandated them to do that. It's impossible. So let's move forward. Again, if we reference a book called Accounts and Papers of the House of Commons, Great Britain, Parliament House of Commons, and it was published in 1847, these are state papers, Index to Session Papers, Session 19 January to 23rd July 1847, we see the following account. So it says, Slavers, Jehovah and Diana, returns of the particulars of the disbursements of the difference between the gross proceeds of the sale of the slave ships Jehovah and Diana and the net proceeds paid into the Admiralty Court, also of the registrar's copy of the condemnation and the martial certificate of the breaking up of the haul and sale of the cargo of the Diana, 1846. So we see that there is no way they can be talking about the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth with these names because by the most basic of common sense if the almighty creator is saying let's say by the bible that you shall not use the name of the lord thy god in vain and the slave ship is named after jehovah our question should be which language is jehovah and who got the name from him because for the almighty creator to have appeared to anyone such a person would have the correct name if in the biblical story of the burning bush, he said, I am who I am, it becomes important for us to ask who got his real name and how, or which language it is. So again, we see that Jehovah was the name of a slave ship. Let us move forward. Again, if we reference a book called The Medici Popes, Leo X and Clement VII by Herbert M. Vaughan, and it was published in 1908. We see the following account. So he quotes Pope Leo X and it says, on a time when Cardinal Bembos did move a question out of the gospel, the Pope gave him a very contemptuous answer saying, all ages can testify enough how profitable that fable of Christ had been to us and our company. It stands to reason that this remark is a spiteful and monstrous invention of a rabid or unscrupulous reformer and the same comment may reasonably be applied to a somewhat similar tale namely that Leo's secretary, the aforesaid Bembo, strictly enjoined his colleague so the little to refrain from studying the Volke lest its indifferent Latin might spoil his elegant and graceful style of writing. So again, you see that they couldn't be referring to the almighty creator of heaven and earth. Also, if we reference a book called Impressions of Western Africa with remarks on the diseases of the climate 
and the reports of the peculiarities of trade up the rivers in the Bight of Biafra by Thomas J. Hutchinson and it was published in 1858. We see the following account. The opening of the slave trade was a blot upon the grand geographical discoveries of the Portuguese in the 15th century. But it should never be forgotten that the trade commenced by Captain Hawkins was legalized in Great Britain for nearly two centuries and was even under royal patronage. In the spirit of that period, one of Hawkins' vessels in his second voyage, which comprised ten ships, was styled the Jesus and another the John the Baptist, while he, the apostle of the trade, was knighted on his return by Queen Elizabeth. So now, if they were doing the slave trade to convert some people to Christianity, and the Muslims said the same thing, it is important that we find out what is behind these their religions. Remember, they claim that their religion is pointing to the almighty creator of heaven and earth. And these two religions are not the same. So it's impossible that they could be pointing to the same God. So if they are not pointing to the same creator, we have to find out who the real creator is. Because it has to be one or the other. It's either they are the same or they are not the same. And you have seen that in all cases, there is no reason to believe that these religions are actually pointing and referring or worshipping the almighty creator of heaven and earth. So now that we have seen what these religions and their God looks like, let us reference for Africa concerning what is of most use in Belieu, Veranius, Celarius, Gliverus, etc. or Atlas Geographus and it was published in 1714. Note the date of publication, 1714. So we see this account. So here we see that in Negro land, the Negroes can neither read nor write and to continue them in ignorance, the priests have enjoined it as a law upon themselves to marry into one another's families and to teach nobody else to read or write so that those poor people have only a confused notion of the being of a god but think it not necessary to pray to him alleging that he who causes tempest thunder and lightning is so potent that he has no need of our prayers and that it's impossible he can have a son and therefore they abhor christian religion so you see that the negroes abhor christian religion so your question should be which god were they worshiping remember it is this same argument that the so-called muslims put up today about how god cannot have a son so you see that before islam and christianity the negroes had these same concepts you see how they have turned everything around and that should tell you that they are not talking about the creator of heaven and earth and if at least if you look at the church look at the mosque study the quran and the bible if they were talking about the same creator of heaven and earth his miracles would have been the same if he could part the red sea then he could still part it now so you see that today he appears a bit more powerless if you think it is the same uh, creator of heaven and earth so you see how deceitful these people are so let us look at one or two more references to prove our point before we round up also if we reference a book called hebraisms of west africa from nile to niger with the jews written by joseph j williams phd and it was published in 1930 we see the following account so we see where it says, Bosman says, it is really the more to be lamented that the Negroes idolize such worthless nothings by reason that several amongst them have no very unjust idea of the deity. For they ascribe to God the attributes of omnipresence, omniscience and invisibility besides which they believe that he governs all things by providence, by reason God is invisible. They say it would be absurd to make any corporal representation of him. So you see that the Negro's concept of the Almighty Creator 
it's better than whatever we have in Christianity and Islam today. And remember, they did not go after other nations and start killing people with it. Whereas these people have been killing people, terrorizing people with their own strand of whoever they consider their God. Again, if you think what we're saying is not correct, all you need to do is you can prove to us that the same omnipresent and omnipotent being referenced here by the Negroes as who they are worshipping at that time is the same as what the Christians and Muslims brought. Then we can begin to see if they are the same. You bring out your facts. Let us move forward before we round up. So if we quickly reference a book called Travels in Africa from Modern Writers with remarks and observations exhibiting a connected view of the geography and present state of the quarter of the globe, written by Reverend William Bingley and it was published in 1819, we see the following. So here it tells us that next to Calvary lies a powerful and populous kingdom called Biafra. Its inhabitants are Negroes and idolaters and are said to be much addicted to magic. Some accounts that have been given of them state that they sacrifice their children to the devil or perhaps rather to a certain imaginary deities which they worship. This country is watered by a wide but shallow river, the source of which is unknown. The capital is of the same name and it's a considerable town distant about 20 leagues from the coast. So again, we see what it tells us here that it is a powerful and populous kingdom called Biafra. It says it sacrifices its children to the devil. So our goal and the onus is on all of us to find out if whatever they were worshipping was actually the devil or the creator of heaven and earth. Notice they say they are addicted to magic. Or if what they worship today in Christianity, Islam or Judaism is the opposite of this. We hope we have been able to give you some thought-provoking issues and things you can research on. We do challenge you to conduct your own research. And we thank you very much for listening. And please remember, as always, to conduct your own research. Shalom.